Okay, no, we can go ahead and start, and then okay. if anyone would like to join us, we'll we'll accommodate. How do you spell it? A G. It's A E G I S Professional Services. All right, well, let me just give you a brief overview, uh, overview of who I do represent. I'm a partner with um, Aegis Professional Services, and as uh, Gabe uh, Feldman, the project manager, was speaking earlier, we are a, uh, a consortium of attorneys and non-attorneys, and what we do is we help startup companies. Um, we help with all of the creativity and the innovative process of putting those comp components together for startup companies, um, and we provide all the services necessary for startups. Uh, that's the topic of you know entrepreneurialism and starting your own company. Um, we also help those companies once they achieve a certain level and you kind of hit your healing on the set on the, on the ceiling and you just you can't really get further until you finally acquire more resources and more support and you've gone just about as far as you can without additional support. That's where E just comes into play as well, and they provide that platform and that energy and those resources that you need in order to take that company to the next level and uh, just very, very innovative, uh, very entrepreneurial. And what I'm speaking on today is, the topic is the uh, pains of growing as an entrepreneur. And I'm sure everybody here can maybe um, relate to that and connect to that in some uh, fashion. I know in the topic, I think in the outline and writing it said it's lonely at the top. But I'm gonna switch that up a little bit because it's really, you know, as I was thinking, preparing some of my notes, I'm going to switch that up and say, it's really lonely at the bottom. And that's where I connect, because when you're starting a company, it's very lonely. Um, because when you're doing something that's very innovative and very novel and unique and one of a kind, you're not gonna have that camaraderie. You're not gonna have those little chats at the water cooler. You're not gonna have those little spontaneous conversations and that exchange down the hallway of the building. Um, a lot of times, those people who are starting something very innovative and very unique and one of a kind, they're buried in the computer, they're doing a lot of research, um, you know, late, lonely hours at night, early morning hours when everybody's still in bed. Um, and so, you know, I do kind of want to emphasize the fact that it's really more lonely at the bottom when you're starting a company, especially, I do want to stress that when you're really doing something that's extremely uh, novel and innovative and paving your own way, it's also difficult to find other people, especially in your own communities, that can connect and relate to the enthusiasm, the excitement, and, the, and you know that energy that you feel. And you're all excited about starting that particular concept or that um, innovative concept and bringing that to fruition. But if it's really unique, most of the people in your world, in your community, they're not going to understand what you're saying. And so, um, what we started about seven years ago was a short sale negotiation uh, practice, a law practice. And literally, when I started this, I had to reach all the way out to the East Coast to find somebody that really knew what this was, because you couldn't find it in a book, you couldn't find it in a, uh, I mean, there wasn't even a book at Barnes & Noble really to figure this out. There was no seminars, and there certainly wasn't another company or a law firm that you could try to get your foot in the door and learn it. Um, and so you really had to reach out and your tentacles had to go quite the distance to find those people that really knew what a short sale was all about. Um, and so everybody here maybe can connect to that in some unique way. And I think it's important that when you're starting a company that you expect that and you have real, realistic expectations and that it is going to be something that where you're this, you know, this lone man on an island um, for a while until you actually create something, create something that, uh, is a it's product and as a service that there's a, a demand for and that you're filling that niche and you develop a system. So I do want to, um, I wanted to spend a little time on that and, and it's important also, and Gabe just mentioned about attitude, when you're starting your company, it's so important to resist the naysayers. I know I've had a lot of naysayers when you're starting something and it's like, why are you doing that? You know, you always have the more of the general population are going to try to get you to do what everybody else is doing. It's kind of the, you know, the, the lemming, um, the lemming syndrome, right? You know, once you get out of uh, law school, for example, when you have to go join the Sandberg Phoenix or one of the big law firms, and you have to do the research and you have to climb the ladder, and then you don't see a courtroom for the next, you know, until another five years or so. So that 
it's really important as an entrepreneur is that you resist those naysayers because you're going to run into 20 naysayers and then you're going to run into one person that's encouraging you. And it's important to have that realistic um, expectation that that's going to happen. Um, and so you have to really have a lot of confidence in your own instinct and your own intelligence and you have to be totally convinced that you are onto something and that with your research you are seeing something you're seeing a, a, a niche you're seeing a void that nobody's filled before and that there is a demand and you have to be really convicted in those in those feelings in order to pursue a lot of the negativity that you might be going through and again you know a lot of that is compounded by the fact that you're starting something innovative, you're not going to have, you know, the clubs and the societies and things like that. So I'm speaking from a maybe a very parochial standpoint because there's a lot of entrepreneurs that are starting their own company that perhaps that they're developing a product or a service that there's a lot out there and they can kind of join, you know, those ranks and there's already a kind of a society and a camaraderie that exists. But if you're doing something really innovative, you're not going to have that. So that's kind of what I'm focusing on. That's something that I did seven years ago. Um, so again, I think the, the takeaway with the first subject is that when you're starting anything, um, that's when it's lonely. Um, so I do want to switch that up. And you really have to have a lot of confidence in your own intelligence, in your own convictions, and your own research. And it's important to be very tenacious to find those other people that are like-minded. And sometimes it can take a long time to find those other people that are like-minded and that share that same enthusiasm and that same passion um, for doing what you're doing and for seeing that opportunity and seeing that niche. And if, you, if you're not tenacious and you don't work really hard to find those other people that share your excitement, you can definitely wear out really fast and you can throw the talent. Because I'm sure for every, um, you know, one successful startup company that's doing something really unique, there's probably a thousand people that try to do the same thing, but they gave up. And so that's so important. And I think the key to not giving up is to put a lot of energy into connecting to those other people that share that same enthusiasm. And you may be calling somebody 2,000 miles across the country to find that person, but if that person in today's technology, it doesn't matter if it's 2,000, or if it's another country, or if it's across an ocean, does it? As long as you find that group of people, that can keep you going. And also kind of restore that confidence in your own intellect that's saying, do this. This is a sleeping giant. This could be successful. So um, I think you know it's, it's important, too, that it's going to be a while when you're starting a company. You're not going to be going to a break room and you know eating somebody's banana bread that they brought in. You're not going to have that. You're not going to have those little chit chats over the uh, coffee pot, the water cooler. Um, but you're also creating something that you can call your own, and that's huge. The next, um, just a subcategory in what I was going to talk about is control. And that is just a, a huge word. Um, what's scary is after you get through this phase, as far as you know, researching, you finally have found a product or a service, and you know that this is going to be successful, you just have to put your energy and your intellect into it and you have to create this thing, this amorphous thing. And once you do that, and once it starts growing and you actually have an enterprise, um, whether it's a service or a product, you actually have your own company now. You have people that are willing to pay you for your service, pay you for your intellect, pay you for that product, whether it's a Bridget or a widget, or if it's just consultation advice. Once you get to that level, you're going to have to relinquish control and that is really scary and it's a paradox because the the character that is required of an entrepreneur is somebody who wants to control um, every entrepreneur who starts their own company they want to control they're very convinced that what they have is going to be successful and they don't want to follow the ant trail and they don't they want to you know dance to their own dance and and have their own drumbeat and so once they get big enough where they have to relinquish that control that is so counterintuitive and it's so hard, but if they don't do that, they will never grow. And it's so important to delegate and find the right people that you can delegate to. Um, and delegation is really, you know, somebody can sit there and say delegate, delegate. Well, it's such an empty word unless you know 
the, the elements to delegation. Delegation is not ever going to happen unless you're a good trainer. You have to train the right person and then you have to develop the right trust. And if you're a good trainer, mentor, educator, call it what you want, but if you're a good trainer and you can train and develop that person and you have a good rapport and trust with that person, then you can delegate. So it's easy to say delegate, delegate. Well, you can't just delegate. You can't just hire somebody off of the you know, internet or indeed.com or the Craigslist and start delegating. You just cannot do that because you are putting at risk everything that may have taken you a year to two years to actually build. Um, so it's so important to find that right person and to train them. Because if you don't train them right, you're never going to delegate. So, and then once you get to that level where you're, you're relinquishing that control, it comes, becomes much easier. Because then you see that you actually have time, which is a beautiful thing. Because then you've got time, and if you're an entrepreneur, you're not going to be spending that time eating bonbons, because that's just not you. You're going to be spending that time making more rain, and creating more connections, and generating more contacts, and creating more ideas, and more concepts, and more ways you can build your company that's just you and that's just the way you're wired. And once you are able to relinquish that control and you see the benefits and the dividends that brings to not just your company, but also to you as a person, you're gonna to wanna to do it more. And you're gonna to wanna to find more good people, more people that are extensions of you, um, more surrogates of you that you can also train and trust and delegate and let it go. I know for personally, um, in my company, in my, my manager who I delegated to, she told me, this was about three years ago, she said, Elizabeth, she said, you're, you're gonna, this is gonna be hard for you. But she said, um, and she was such a good manager, but she said, I'm gonna stop copying you on the emails. And I was getting 150, <laughs> 200 emails, you know, probably every three hours or whatever. And I certainly didn't read them all because that's insane. But <clears throat> she said, you know, it's gonna be hard for you. And she knew me very well. And we got through that, but it was incremental. Um, and so she would copy me on some of the emails, you know, on some of the major issues. And then I was okay with that. And I, I was going out doing the presentations and doing the workshops that I needed to do. And then after a couple of weeks, you know, she knew that, okay, she's, she's ready for the next level. And then she cut out the rest of the emails. And eventually after about a month, I was not being copied on any of the emails. And it was such a wonderful thing because instead of all those hundreds and hundreds of emails that I was getting, I just simply had a review with her. So I had a review with her I, every week. And then every week she was able to tell me everything that was happening in the company. Um, and we had such a unique culture that anybody that worked for us was very uninhibited just to pick up the phone and call me and say, hey, you know, let's talk. I mean, it might be something that they would feel a little awkward in talking to Tracy about me, my manager or um, whatever. And I made sure that it was clear that anybody could call me at any time. I mean, I'd call them back within, you know, six hours, but I definitely would get back to them. Um, and that was very important. So what is also related to control is that you have to surround yourself with experts. And that means you've got to know what you don't know. Now, I would write that on the board, but we have very limited time here and that'd be a waste of time. But we all know you have to know what you don't know. And that's sometimes more important than knowing what you do know. And it really is. And if you just say, I know what I don't know, then you need to surround yourself with those people who do have that capacity and that expertise in those areas, such as a good accountant, um, such as a good attorney. Um, I'm an attorney, but I didn't know how to put together you know, some operating agreements and things like that because that's not the kind of attorney I am. So I hired a corporate attorney about five years ago to put together operating agreements and LLCs and consultation agreements and things that I could have done, but it would have taken me, you know, hours upon hours of researching and putting, and I just, that wasn't time well spent for me. I needed to basically build my company. So what's important under that umbrella of control and relinquishing control is know what you don't know and hire the experts or surround yourself with those experts and sometimes a lot of times, you don't have to pay for those experts. We all know people love to talk about what they know. It's human nature. And if you can have a cup of coffee with somebody who's really an expert in their field, and you just want to pick their brain and let them just talk about themselves, they love it. They love it. We're all like that. And it's amazing 
the human nature, I'm a firm believer in human nature. Um, you wouldn't believe how much trust that I built this company on and how much risk and exposure I put my company in that a lot of people wouldn't have, I mean, in terms of trusting my people. But um, it's so important to be able to find those people that are willing to go out and have that cup of coffee, have that glass of tea with you, and just talk. Um, when I was building this company, I would talk to people in Florida and North Carolina and at New Jersey, and they were so excited to get a call from me, and as I was excited to get a call from them, because we were doing something so unusual, there wasn't anybody in between. So it's like, oh, I'm so glad we get to talk about this. And it, and it was funny because they'd say, it's so fun to talk about, you know, short sales to somebody who actually sees the excitement in it. And when we started this, the economy was crashing, and everybody was, you know, screaming the Great Depression. And so everybody was, you know, very defeatist, very negative, very depressed. And we were all excited because we were seeing this kind of as the next, you know, tsunami, which it really did become. So as far as control, um, I do want to just emphasize that the comfort level of giving up that control is a function of your ability to train and to find the right person. And if you can't find the right person and you cannot train, then you're never going to relinquish that control. But believe me, you can do it. And once you do it, it's easier and easier and easier. Also, know what you don't know and make your world wider. Don't just look at your little core world. If you don't have somebody in your Rolodex, that um, knows something that you need to know, well, Google it. And if they're in California, who cares? Call them. It's amazing what, you know, how people want to talk. They just want to talk about what they know. Um, and I can't tell you the hours and hours and hours and hours of conversations I've had with people I never knew. And then we ended up becoming really strong colleagues to where we built our own support system. And I had an attorney in Florida that was helping me, giving me ideas, I was giving him ideas. We didn't compete, so we just shared everything, just unabashed. Um, there was an attorney in Michigan, um, there was a, an expert who did short sale negotiations who was not an attorney, but a broker in North Carolina. And we would talk to each other at least every month. And it was amazing because we didn't do that. Um, we probably would have hit our head on the ceiling a long, long time ago and never went any further. So again, control is uh, a huge part of growing and if you don't relinquish it, you're not gonna grow. You're not gonna go to the next level. So I wanted to mention that. Financial liability is something else that's, uh, you know, the, the title is pain, so I'm going through all the pains. Um, I'm also infusing some excitement into it, which I probably just need to talk about painful stuff. So third painful stuff is financial liability. When you, when most people grow a company, they do it very organically um, because they don't know if it's going to succeed. So you're not going to go out and, you know, invest and get a mortgage on a big building or a Taj Mahal, and you're not going to go out and buy the cord coffee makers. You're just not. I mean, because if you're an entrepreneur, you're intelligent, so naturally you're not going to do that. So you're going to grow this thing organically, and you're going to grow it incrementally, and you're going to see if it works, and you're going to put all of your faith and all of your research and energy behind it. But interestingly, almost every entrepreneur, as they grow their company that way, you get to the point where it's, you know, you get spoiled because the company is a cash flow. And so you don't have to borrow any money because you're just like in our business, we don't have a product. So we don't have the cost of goods sold. We don't have an inventory. We don't have a warehouse. So in our business, we're all, it's Intel. It's it's, it's negotiation and it's consultation and, you know, we're legal services. And so we, you get to the point where it's like um, you're cash flowing and you've got a profit and the thing and it's, it's all great and you have no debt, which is a beautiful thing, but you get used to it. And then all of a sudden you get to the level where you can't get any better. You just cannot until you expand your footprint. Well, guess what? To expand your footprint, you can't do this incremental organic thing anymore. It doesn't work. You gotta turn your model on its face, 180, upside down, and all of a sudden everybody says to get to the next level, you can't do this thing without going out and investing and throwing money into something. You can't make money if you don't spend money. And all of a sudden you're hiring marketing directors and you're getting a line of credit and you've got this rent and you know, you've got uh, two marketing directors on salary and you've got some other project managers that you're wanting to hire and You've got legal services and, you know, you've got your accounting skyrockets because now all of a sudden, you know, the little guy that did the file manager that also did the bookkeeping, that also did the payroll, 
that's not going to work if you go to the next level. So all of a sudden, you're incurring debt. And that's a scary thing. And that's where you have to go back to your original reason why you started your company. And it's the faith and confidence in this thing that you created. And it's no longer yourself. It develops a life of its own. And you have to really pull from that confidence. And you incur that debt because you know you've got to spend money to make money to break through that next level, get to the next level, and expand your footprint. And incurring that debt is a function of confidence, which is a function of research. Blind faith doesn't, doesn't have anywhere to do with business. There's no such thing as blind faith. The, the confidence in your company is soundly based upon research and soundly based upon what you've discovered in your own research in your own contacts and into proof of what your company has done for the last five or six or seven years. Um, so again, it's, I think it's a phenomenon that happens with every small company um, because when you start a company, you don't incur the debt, you just kind of dip your toe in and you kind of test market it, you get a little bit bigger and you get a little bit bigger and you get a little bit bigger, but that's, that's not going to work forever if you want to keep growing the company. And then you've got licensee fees, and you've got maybe patent fees, and you've got systems you've got to buy, and it goes crazy. And then again, you're relinquishing a lot of control as well. Um, one thing I want to mention that's really important, I'm probably going to go over time, so Dave's going to stop me, but I, I forgot to mention this. In control, and it's so important, I don't want to be remiss about this. You want an identity crisis. And I know that sounds weird, but in relinquishing control, it's... It's a good feeling when people, your customers, clients, stop thinking of your company as you. So what's your first name? Allison. Allison. So it's a really, it's a, it's a great day when people are calling your company instead of Allison. You, you know why, right? You don't want people calling Allison. They'll never get anything done. So once you get to that point with your company where they don't think about you as a person who's the founder, which naturally you kind of want that because everybody's a little, you know, like, wow, I created this thing. After a while, you're tired of it. You want to, you're so tired of it, you want to take your name off of it. And that's even the better thing. You can take your name off of it and people still want that XYZ company because that's the go-to. That's what takes the presence when they think of short sale. I've got a short sale. I'm going to think of the short sale law center. And that's the name of our company. I'm actually taking the name off of the company as we expand, because you don't want that. So the takeaway from this is that you want that identity crisis if you're a truly an entrepreneur and you want to get as big as you can, because you've got something great. You don't want people thinking of you when you think of, when they think of, I need that widget, I need that bridge, because if they think of you, they're going to want to talk to you. They're not going to want to talk to you if you're one of 50 employees. They're not going to want to talk to David or Susie or Smith or Tom. They're going to want to talk to Allison, and you don't want that because you're not going to get anywhere. So I wanted to mention that because that's kind of a counterintuitive thing, and counterintuitive things I think are fun to talk about because those are things that you just don't naturally realize until you go through it. Um, so that was a little uh, regressing a little bit, but I didn't want to miss it. So the financial liability, um, incurring the, the, the debt in order to get bigger. I also wanted to mention, too, that it's important as you're – Taking your company to the next level, which is requiring all these things that are new to you that you're having to adjust to. You're having to adjust up here. You're having to adjust your mindset and the way you look at things. Um, you also have to partner. It's so important to partner with people. Partner with Aegis. Partner with the people like the, the Gabes of the world and the Scott Levines and the Nick Shops. Partner with people that can help you, that you can collaborate with, that are like-minded, that have that entrepreneurial energy and that sees the potential in your company. That's truly, truly important. And it, the neat thing is, uh, it's kind of bittersweet, but you can't partner with those people when you're little bitty small potatoes. Because it's like, well, go out and prove it and come back to me. Oh, I did a little bit more. Well, that's not enough. Go out and prove, you know, bring me some more. But you have to get to that level to where they're interested, and then you can actually see that synergy between partnering with people with like-minded and has, has those resources and the business consultation services, um, the accounting services, um, the marketing, which is huge, the marketing services that you need so desperately to get your company to the next level. Um, there are three words that I wanted to mention, and I read this actually on LinkedIn, and I love it, but success... Successful companies have three things, and I love putting things through hoppers and distilling things. 
because things are so complicated these days. But if you have a product and a process and people, you're going to be successful. And those are the only three things that you need. But each word is huge. So you've got to have a product, okay? That could be a widget or a bridge, or it could be a service, it doesn't matter. You've got to have the process, which we are currently working on. We have, uh, we're working on our operational efficiencies. And I know we can improve there. And it, it's fun, because we're trying to tweak it every day. But that's the process, you've got to have the process. If you do things in a very inefficient way, you're never going to get anywhere. You know, you're going to you're going to be the guy that's driving the nail and the board. You're not going to have the crew. You're going to be hammering the nail. You don't want to hammer the nail. So, and then the third thing is the people. And I probably said that in reverse order because, it, personally, what I would say, people is first. If you don't have the right people, you're never going to go anywhere. That's so important. Of course, it starts with you. But you got to hire the right people so that you can trust and you can train and you can delegate and then you can do it again and again and again and you have a product, and you have a process. And so, the first two that have to happen simultaneously is your product and your people. The process, that can be a little clumsy at first, and that's okay, because it's always gonna be a little clumsy, a little inefficient. You're always gonna be improving that. That's just a continuum, and that never, never stops. Um, how much time do I have? You're doing all right. I am? You've probably got about another five minutes or so. Okay, so. Or we can move straight to Q&A if you guys have questions. <laughs> well, my last, my last thing is I can do it in two minutes, and then we do Q&A. Yeah, go right ahead. And that's just, um, and this is painful streamlining. This is yeah. painful. Painful because what I just told everybody here is that people are so important. And all of a sudden, sometimes you have to cut them, and that's hard. So, um, let me just say this. Part of operational efficiencies, and I, I don't, I really want to be focused here. We just talked about how you have to get to the next level, right? And, and that third component of a successful company is, is process. To be efficient, you have to have people who are willing to work full time. And we just, at least in my company, of course that's not a general statement, that doesn't apply to everybody, we all know that. I can only speak from personal experience. But we've had to cut some people to trim the fat, to, to come up with our core. And we knew if we were going to take this company to the next level, we had to have a core. And if we didn't identify that core, we weren't gonna make it. So we wanted to have that really strong core, and we did that in the last three weeks. Wasn't as hard as I thought, it actually went smoother, but now we went from a certain number of people, we had to let go about a third, but they were part-time and they weren't that committed anyway, they kinda of had one toe in type of thing. So it was more painful for me, and I had more trepidation about it than what they did, and everything was fine. But streamlining can be a very painful process, but you have to do that with the people too. You have to have a certain standard, and if you have that gold standard, then you have to only hire those people who are willing to work up to that gold standard, because they're not always gonna be gold standard, but they've gotta be coachable, they've gotta want that. And if they don't want that, then they may not fit your program. So that streamlining can be quite painful. So um, let's open it up for Q&A. Do they have a question? Allison? <laughs> uh, I will tell you, I also am a lawyer. So okay. I know several people at your firm. Great. It's a great firm. Great. Awesome. Um, so anyway, and, but I also am a uh, business owner and an entrepreneur. So that's where I come from. And delegating is very hard for anybody, certainly for lawyers who are like go up and down. So you can relate to that, can't you? Right. But you have your own business, right? Yes. Or you started at your own business. Yes. 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 Uh huh. Several then, businesses. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I started a few. Yeah. But that's really the most valuable thing in advising other businesses yes. is having your own. You just don't understand, and the delegating. It's just hard. It is. And hiring the right people, it's just like dating. You just, there's no. <laughs> that was awesome. Do you know what I mean? There's no I, perfect way to do it. You just have to go through a few and you get better at it over time. That's and I do true. employment law. So okay. I thought it would be very easy to hire people and it has no correlation whatsoever. It just takes a while to yeah. find those magical people and it just all of a sudden clicks. Right, right. And so you just have to get through it. And like anything else in entrepreneur, um, entrepreneurialism, uh -huh. one more beer. Yep. I will say that. Um, it's just get out there and do it. Mm -hmm. Lawyer, like lawyers are so nice. We're, we're, 
we're not only risk averse, like we want to manage out any risk. You can't do that. <laughs> you just can't do it. Entrepreneurialism yeah. is great. You kind of have to go on a limb, and you got to trust to be convinced of. Just get out there and do it. Your You're ideas. Not gonna, you may not find the right people, and I'm good at firing people, so I can't ever help. <laughs> okay. Well, it doesn't. If, only if you have time, right? Sometimes the company at the at a very important stage that if you hire people and fire people, then you are wasting the time. Well, you're right, and you may be at a key point where you need to get a project done, yeah. and you just need the bodies. They may not be the perfect bodies, but you need the bodies doing it, and you're right. You're exactly right. That's um, a good point. Yeah. Very and, good point. And you have to, but you have to just trust your instincts on that. Yeah. And you know, I mean, if you're an entrepreneur, you know a lot of it is just trust in your instincts, mm -hmm. whether you stick with somebody or don't stick with somebody, whether you stick with a product or don't stick with a product or whatever it is. Um, and you just learn to trust that. The more you fall down, I tell my brother this all the time, he's an IT guy, you just have to fall on your butt more often. You know what? The more you fall down and you get up and you survive, you go, oh, oh, you can survive that. Okay, well, that's all right. And then it just gets easier and easier. So, but, but there's no there's no way to get around it except doing it. Yeah. So if you've had your own business, you know. I mean, that's just you're the definitely, best way. Definitely got to fail. Nancy, yeah. do you have a comment? You, you're the first one that came in, and I'm going to... Pick on you a little bit. Um, well, I'm not looking to start a business. I'm looking to buy a business. So okay, interesting. Um, a lot of the a lot of the things that you talked about are, are it's going to be and, applicable. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but oh, yeah, yeah, definitely a lot of fear because when you buy a business, you're taking on the liability right off the mm bat. -hmm. Well, as a business owner, everything I talked about is going to apply to you. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's interesting. Looking yeah. to buy a business. That's that's kind of a closed network, as I understand. You have to really network and talk to the right people to find other businesses that are for sale. Mm -hmm. It's not like you can go onto some website and these are all the businesses for sale. Right. That's just a tip right. of the iceberg. You right. have to no, know I've got the, right the company I want to buy. It's just good. You know, how do you find the money? How do you, um, you know, all those things that go into it. Right. But the elements right. she's talking about are the most important. What are their processes mm -hmm. and who are their people? Yeah. And whoever the key people are, you lock those in. I mean, you have to, you better get some good guidance, but lock those people in. Mm -hmm. And the processes, if they have those in place, everything and that's else the will easiest sort itself out. To fix. So mm -hmm. if you have the people in the product, the process is something that you can always fix. In my mind. Well, I think I've got the people, the product, and the process. That's great. If you've so got all now three. it's just getting the, mm -hmm. the money and yeah. the structure. and Right. Yeah. Right. Nathan, what about you? Um, well, and I was mentioned. trying to think of a way that I could phrase my thoughts into a question. Uh, yeah, what has gotten there so How about a comment? Don't think about a question. It's going to be more of a comment at yeah, this point. I was, I was really uh, kind of going back to uh, the whole concept of once you're at the stage where you've got the growth that as, as a startup right. you know, in, in that scenario, You've been waiting for that ever since you got your seed capital. Mm -hmm. Now you finally have some money you're earning on your own, and you don't have time to do all of it yourself like you've been used to doing for so long. Uh, just as a bit of background, I work for a company that provides online strategy and integrated marketing services. We do some business consulting and marketing consulting and such as well. And uh, I, I've been looking at the startup company, but it startup business uh, community. Uh, of course, and there's a lot of great businesses, a lot of great ideas, but it is really about timing for them because you don't want to jump into delegating things too early, uh, especially if it's, uh, you know, especially if uh, as opposed to hiring someone on staff, right. there's a lot of advantages, advantages to actually hiring a, a firm to handle that aspect for you. Now, there's a lot of people, for instance, that use ADP because they don't want to use their own, they don't want to do their own payroll and HR stuff. Mm -hmm. That is too much of a headache for them. Well, we do the website, the social media, all that stuff. <laughs> and it really is a matter of, uh, you know, getting them to, to let go of, uh, okay, I understand you, you can do this, but you're an expert at, uh, right, you know, yeah. building a, a new thing. Well, we do that, so. Oh. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, let's say you're an expert at, uh, you know, something biotech. Yeah. Focus on that. Right. Don't don't bother with the Twitter posts and all that. Exactly. There are other people who are experts, and that's their bread and butter. And uh, I can understand from... Uh, you know, just imagining from an entrepreneurial aspect, that is, it's kind of hard to let that go. It because is. you've been used winning to doing it for so long. Yeah. You have to think of it. it you're, you're still winning, but you're winning through other people. Exactly. Yeah. You know, yeah. there's that book, what, what Got You There Won't Get You. What, what Got You Here Won't Get You There. And if, you know, well, and the people, it, I know exactly what yeah. Mean. The thing, when you, when you have success, and, and you're like, the one thing I've done for years is so important, I always credit the people in the firm. Like, I mean, we have been blessed with so many good people. It's, it's very productive, very successful people. And the more acknowledgement and recognition and credit that you can give your people, 
it'll just come, you know, and the, the less you can give yourself, especially when you're out there publicly, you give it to your people, because that, people love to hear that, and it's exactly. true, well, and then that also gets back to your people. Identity crisis. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. That was really a good point. Yeah. You have yeah. to have an identity crisis. You have to have an identity crisis to really grow. The yeah, first really time you good. go to Florida for a week and everything's getting done while you're playing golf, you are in. Yeah. <laughs> or you're out. Depending you, on how you look at it. You <laughs> buy into the whole delegation thing. You're like, all right, I can let go. <laughs> and, and that just that, that brought me to another idea that kind of made things click for me is that's uh -huh. why, I mean, not all of them, a lot of them do want to stick with it and watch it grow, but there's a huge percentage of entrepreneurs and people who build startups that then intentionally, once they get to that identity they crisis stage, they sell it. They're, They're sell like, it. okay, I'm not even in this anymore. Just give me a chunk of cash. Right. And, and they end up selling it to Google or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And make a lot of money. I know, yeah. yes. yes. You know, there's, there is some advantage in that because they, those people, apparently, they are able to let it go once it gets to that point. Well, and their, their <laughs> character, too, which, you know, I think I, I admire because they get a little jaded. They have so much creativity inside that they they master it and it's like okay i'm ready to do something else they get bored and they're like okay let's move on yeah. i think it's great that I makes mean, a lot of sense just they do they just get jaded they just they master it they want to do something else so i mean i can i can relate to that to a little degree so. always learning that's that's a, a good way to be so right. piggybacking on that my favorite question to ask serial entrepreneurs anyone that started their own their company what's the best worst mistake that you made oh good one the best worst mistake that i made mm -hmm. oh wow um the best worst. <laughs> I don't even know what you're asking. I'm well, gonna say the best. The mistake. way I interpret it, yeah. learn from mistakes. The, yeah. yeah, the best, the best, the biggest mistake that I made that I benefited from. That's exactly what I'm. Okay, about. now I can understand. That. Okay. Um. Hmm. The biggest mistake that I made that I benefited. What the best lesson you ever learned? Either. <laughs> Which usually involves <laughs> mistakes sometimes. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um. Oh gosh. Hold on. Okay, I got it. Okay. Yeah, okay, I got it. Seven years ago, I almost bought a, or I was gonna do it myself, but I was almost going to start a drive-through coffee chain. And I had big ideas, so I was gonna start in St. Louis, and I was gonna be national, we're gonna have these coffee chains. And people, I always knew that I was a big coffee drinker, I'm not so much anymore, but anyway, I was gonna put all my energy into creating this big um, chain of drive-through coffee. But Starbucks, you know, you have to go in, you get to Starbucks, but drive through, you get it fast. And, and then also have couriers take these, this is a great idea if anybody wants to do it. You take um, your your triple lattes, whatever, to high rises, because people, people don't have time to stop, you know, on their way to work. They don't have time, they're lazy, they're, you know, they're, they're in and out. They go to their office and have a beautiful, you know, triple latte, whatever it is, with all those fancy words, you know, six words, and describe one cup of coffee, sitting on their desk because you've got a company that brought it to them. I almost started that seven scary. years ago. Well, then the market crashed. Had I started it when I wanted to, I probably would have lost because that's discretionary income. When the market crashed, nobody's going to spend money on Starbucks or, you know, six dollars for a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. So that was the, you know, I was going to say that's probably the best thing I didn't do. I don't know if I answered your question directly on point, mm -hmm. um, but I think that that's something that could probably apply today. And something else, I was going to go into medical school, and that was probably, I consider that a mistake that I didn't go into medical school because it was my first law, but I'm so glad that I didn't, because I wouldn't have had the balance in my personal life had I gone into and been a doctor. And you need both. Hmm, thank you. Thank you. All right. That's a lot of interest right there. Yeah. <laughs> Are we done? Can we ask? Yeah.